Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's podcast. Be interviewing Sergey from Moldova. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation about what God's been doing there. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to season three of FBC Bernie's So That Missions podcast. This is an encouraging place to hear how God is working in and around us. We know that He blesses His people so that they can bless the world around them. Join us as we discuss how to join God in all that He's doing. Why is God working in our life, our church, and our community? It's so that through us, the world will know that He is near. Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Chad with FBC's So That Missions podcast. We're so glad that you are joining us today. We have a special guest with us. His name is Sergey. He's from Moldova. Uh, Sergey, how are you, brother? I'm doing well, thank you. So glad to have you with us. How are you enjoying your visit to Texas this year? I uh, like the weather, so I'm I'm glad I'm past your heat heating season. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cooled down a little bit. What's the weather like in Moldova this time of year? Oh, we have four seasons. It's already cooling down a little bit. So, okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back to a cooler weather. Some cool weather, yes. of course. Of course, we are too. It's we're right here on the edge of things getting going from very hot to uh, to to getting much cooler. In fact, I saw. This coming week, we have a morning that's going to be in the 40s, which is uh, very cool for us and be the coolest day we've had in six or seven months. So <laughs> we're looking forward to that. Well, um, Sergey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your family, um, your age, uh, your children, and uh, let's get to know you just a little bit. Uh, well, I've been uh, married for uh, 19 years. Okay. So I uh, met my wife at our church. Uh, she came from a different church. Uh, uh, in fact, she was uh, one of my um, English students when I taught English at the seminary. But I tell people we didn't date while I was teaching, so everything was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure we get to the ground rules here. <laughs> yes, yes, we have the rules there as well. So um, we've, we have two kids, uh, a boy, uh, seven, and uh, a girl, uh, 12. It's easier to remember our birthdays because my girl shares a birthday with my wife. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, my boy was born on July 4th. That uh, was our gift to the United States. So. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. What are their names? Uh, uh, Ksenia. Ksenia uh, is and, the girl. And Nikita. Is and Nikita boy. is the boy. And my wife's name is Olga. It's Olga. Okay, great. Well, uh, that's that's great. Um, you guys have been married for Almost 20 years now. That's Almost uh, 20 years. That's awesome. So how old are you, Sergey? I'm uh, 47. 47. Okay, great. And uh, you mentioned the seminary. We're going to talk a little bit more later about the church and the seminary. Um, well, tell me, 47 years, has Moldova changed much since you've been living there, since you've been alive? How's the country look different? Uh, yes, I was born uh, during Soviet Union times, so Moldova has really changed a lot. Uh, uh, I was growing up in a public school uh, where uh, religion was forbidden. In fact, uh, my favorite uh, motto was uh, religion is uh, opium for the nations by uh, Karl Marx. Uh -huh. And so um, that's what I like to say out loud because we, we had uh, two Baptists uh, going to our uh, class. Okay, so, so anytime, you would put, you would poke fun at them. Anytime I had a, <laughs> uh, anytime I had a chance to mock them, I did that. Yeah, so. wow. Well, tell me how did how did you come to faith? What how how do you go from growing up in a Soviet Union with with communist thinking and and training uh, to to becoming a follower of Jesus and eventually te teaching in a seminary? So so tell me that story. So I uh, probably in the fourth grade, uh, I started getting myself into witchcraft, which was very uh, appealing and attractive to me. Uh, so and after a really weird encounter with uh, what I believe was demonic, I ran to God. I spoke to my grandma, who was a uh, devout Orthodox believer, and she gave me a little cross uh, saying, uh, the, the, which said it on the back, save and protect. That became my prayer. That's how I mm. first learned about God. So I was uh, about 10 years old, uh, wow. 10, 11 years old. Uh, then uh, when Soviet Union fell apart in 91, we had uh, uh, teams coming from all over the world uh, sharing Christ in Moldova. Uh, uh, one of my cousins uh, saw some Americans on the bus. He came up to them. 
uh, got to know them through the translator, then invited uh, me and we were invited to what they called an American club. Uh, during the club, they shared uh, the American culture, shared their lives and shared uh, about Christ. So mm. from my childhood, I knew God existed because he helped me. But I didn't know all the details. I Nobody told me I was still a sinner or anything like that. So uh, it was good to talk to them, and I actually waited for someone to come and tell me more. Um, as they left, they left a group of uh, students, about 10 uh, Moldova University students, who started a small group. That's how I started attending the small groups, a uh, small group. And um, I, um, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, so it was my first trade. Uh, I had to go to Russia for a couple of months. When I got back, that group already just grew into a small church. And since my cousin was going there, I started going there for fun. And three weeks later, uh, prayed to receive Christ. At wow. Church. Wow. So so the church, I, I'm assuming it's uh, KBC. It's Kishinev Bible Church. Kishinev Bible Church. Um, that church started as 10 students in a, in a room. Because before... Before the the breakup of the Soviet Union, there weren't Christian churches uh, were, uh, very often. There weren't there were very common. Baptist churches and there, there were, were Baptist churches. Yes, okay. There were Baptist churches, uh, mainly underground. You know, uh, very controlled uh, by mm-hmm. the government, and some Pentecostal churches as well. So um, I believe our church was the first uh, evangelical church in Moldova. Wow, wow, and uh, that's that's unbelievable. Started in a with ten students and then grew into a church. Um, sure. The pastors of that church today, um, I know you're one of those, and uh, and, and Eugene he, he, is, he, he, yes. is so, another one of them. So we co-pastor. We've uh, co-pastored together for almost uh, 20 years. Um, uh, the founding pastor uh, came from uh, San Antonio, Texas. Oh, wow. And, uh, so he started leading this small group that grew into a church, and then mm-hmm. he left in 2002, uh, giving everything, I mean, to a Moldovan uh, Sure. Uh, full full Moldov- Moldovan leadership. Yes. And uh, are there other pastors uh, or just the two of you guys? Yeah, we co-pastor and then we have, uh, we have uh, ordained ministers that uh, uh, okay. serve with us. Okay. Amazing. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, Eugene was also part of that early group, wasn't he? It was the students, the 10 students? He came probably two weeks after I came to church. Two weeks after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he was invited by my cousin to beat up a guy at church. <laughs> That's he how, was invited to beat up a guy at that's church. How, that's how he started. That was how church. he got involved. That was yes. that was his introduction <laughs> to the church. I love that story. I can't wait to talk to him more about that that particular thing. It'd be really fun. One of the things I love is is just the idea that there's places in the world where the gospel really has not has not been established. Places that it's illegal. Places where it's very difficult. Uh, places where where the gospel just has not been able to take root in its population. Um, and in many of those places, there's this feeling that it's just almost impossible. Like it, you feel like the church is defeated or you feel like the church because many times there's heavy persecution or the government is very strong. But what's so encouraging about your story and about the story of Moldova is that the Lord made a way. And and then out of that, where there was very limited faith previously, God raised up leaders from within. So some people will use it, they say that the 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 leadership comes from the harvest field, right? It's it's from the new believing generation, from that new group of believers is where God raised up leaders, and uh, and those leaders are fully formed. They're they've been leading now the church for twenty years uh, plus, and and uh, and and in that story, I think it's one of the things that we as Americans don't very we don't understand very well because like First Baptist Church has been here for one hundred and thirty years. And there are other places uh, in the country where there's churches that are closer to 200 years old. Now, of course, you go to Europe and you find churches that are 2,000 years old or 1,800 years old, and 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 so it doesn't it doesn't feel. But then there's places like Moldova, where in many ways Christianity is new, maybe maybe just two or three decades uh, where the Lord has been working. And so I, I'm so thankful. Um, that we get to hear these stories and, and hear about what God's doing. So tell tell me a little bit about how the church developed and grew, and 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 uh, and tell me about the church today. But maybe give us a little history and then kind of where the church is. So uh, as I mentioned, the church was started by a, a pastor from uh, the United States who who came and uh, 
his desire was actually to help uh, some Baptist churches with Sunday school classes. Uh, then a couple of months uh, down the road, uh, it didn't work out. Uh, he started uh, leading the small group. Uh, and then we started growing. We started praying for our parents to come uh, to know the Lord. Uh, and our parents started joining the church. So our church was growing pretty fast. So we had to change uh, several locations uh, pretty fast uh-huh. uh, because we were getting, we were getting big. Uh, during these times, uh, I guess starting uh 96, God started giving me ministries and uh, uh, directions in church. Uh, the funniest part is uh, how he would give me a ministry. Uh, I almost got married in 96. Uh, I was uh, not even 20 years old uh, to an American. And my desire was to leave the country. Mm. God stopped that relationship and he uh, broke me, showed me uh, a new vision for, for the ministry, gave me love for my country, for my people, and just started throwing ministries at me, mm. just throwing opportunities. Uh, so... Um, uh, as the church was developing, I was a part. I, I was a part of the uh, developing team, uh, uh, the ministry group uh, of the church. I led uh, prayer ministry. I led uh, Sunday school ministry, uh, and then uh, in two thousand, I became a seminary student. Now um, I used to teach English starting ninety uh, six uh, uh, at a public school. Um, I just had a certificate, uh, but because school, uh, sc- our schools had a uh, shortage in uh, English instructors, uh, I was still invited to teach. And I always believe I don't have to be a, a pastor. I don't have to go to the seminary to be a pastor. And sure. I really never wanted to be a pastor. But um, in my morning uh, prayer and devotional time, the uh, Lord st- told me, uh, you're going to the seminary, on, and I'll use you in uh, Christian education. So where did you go to seminary? Uh, the seminary, I went to Moldova Bible Seminary, the okay. seminary that was founded by our church as well. Okay, okay. So um, so uh, how long did it take from the church being founded? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was ni- 96. Uh, 93. 93, until the seminary started. So the seminary started uh, 95. Okay. And then something didn't work out with the professors, uh, uh, and then it it still continued. You know, mm-hmm. we had less classes, sure, sure. but uh, uh, officially probably ninety six. Ninety six, so. that's amazing. So, are there other evangelical seminaries uh, in Moldova? Uh, Yes, the, yes. The, the, there are uh, a few. A few. At the time, that must have been something that was starting really quickly. Within three years of the church being founded, there's a seminary, and you guys have some visiting instructors, and then you start um, getting Moldovan leaders to to teach in the seminary as well. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, again, um, just for our listeners, you know, seminaries are places that train, specifically train pastors. There's typically theolo- theolog- theological education, um, you know, things that, that talk about how to, how to preach, how to interpret God's word, how to understand scriptures. Typically there's Greek and Hebrew, um, kind of classes along the way so that you can try to read in the original languages. And, uh, and so you can imagine in a country where there was very little Christianity, um, as soon as the country opened up and now you have access to start churches, uh, really quickly, you want to have the ability to train key leaders with, with core competencies in in the christian faith and so uh, i love hearing that too so the capacity to train and equip pastors was now within moldova and uh and the church there was 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 very very uh, key in getting it started it still continues today the seminary is a big part of what we do in our partnership uh, with moldova um so that that takes us like 96 so there's been a few years since then uh how has the church grown how has christianity in in moldova um it, uh, it, looked over the last 20, 20 plus years? Well, since the fall of uh, Soviet Union, uh, people uh, were receiving gospel by hundreds. We had many crusades in the city, and people were eager to hear uh, God's word. People were eager to start reading the Bible, uh, which prompted us to start the seminary. Uh, and um, we have two directions, uh, uh, pastoral uh, education and uh, Christian education. 
uh, and uh, uh, we noticed that w- we have a lot of opportunities to share Christ in Moldova and beyond. You know, so we started. Uh, I mean, we sent missionaries from the seminary uh, on yearly basis, uh, either to Europe or to former uh, Soviet Union republics, uh, as well. And uh, uh, God's been showing miracles uh, uh, through that. Mm. Uh, the church started developing uh, again fast. We started getting connected with uh, many churches, uh, and uh, there is a big desire today to create a movement. That uh, uh, that is a disciple making movement sure. and church planting movement. Uh-huh. So uh, we're still learning. We're still uh, in the process uh, of doing that. But we have uh, many partnerships with uh, many churches uh, in in Moldova, mm-hmm. uh, different denominations, you know, and uh, which is a big blessing. Sure. So uh, and of course when. Uh, the war started last year. Uh, uh, it was a lot of confusion, but uh, uh, during these hard times, the church in Moldova became one. Uh, all the churches got together and started working together. And because of that, we have uh, even more partnerships. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're eager to help other churches with anything we can, you know, and uh, the churches are open to uh, also to help, to communication, to uh future projects uh, that we do together. That's, that's amazing. Uh, the whole, I mean, the globe, the, the whole world has had so much um, conflict over the last three years. COVID kind of began the whole, I would, I would say a transformation of the way Christianity is offered. I mean, many churches globally had to stop for a season. How did, how did the global pandemic uh, work? And did you guys have to stop meeting as a church for, for a while there uh, yeah, we- in Moldova? We had to stop for probably half a year. Oh, okay, six so, months or so. so. So something like that. Yeah, and uh, and then restarting. When you restarted, was it a smaller group? It took a while to kind of rebuild momentum. That seems to be pretty common. It was a smaller group because uh, we were afraid uh, they uh, will be checked on, you know, so uh-huh. we had to put a bigger distance. Uh, sure. Uh, people had to let us know ahead of times that they're coming to okay. the meetings. Uh, we started online uh, uh, online sermons so mm-hmm. those who cannot come could uh, view it from home. Right. And uh, just as many churches around the world, uh, we lost about 30% of people. 30%. Yeah, we're so slowly building back. I, I feel like that's, I hear that kind of constantly. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, um, it definitely is, is one of the, the takeaways. There's a, what do they call them? The Duns. There's a group of people they call the Duns. Like they, they realized they didn't have to go to church to be in church and they never came back, uh, kind of a group. But many churches say the same thing that you're doing, that there's a, a slow growth that they're going back. And, and, uh, and many, many places in the world, people have returned to their kind of normal numerical numbers before. Um, but many of them are new to the church. There, uh, some that left never came back, and so um, it's it is an interesting season uh, for the church um, in general. So, how about the seminary? How did the seminary weather the the storm? How did they? How did the seminary do during COVID? You guys moved to online courses. We had uh, yes, we had online courses uh, for the uh, seminary. Uh, we had a good partnership with an online seminary, so we were able to provide uh, materials, you know, provide uh, 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 the needed education for the students. Uh-huh. Uh, so um, uh, it was, uh, I don't think we lost any students during mm-hmm. that time. I mean, we just continued continue teaching and then slowly started coming back, you uh-huh. know, and because... Uh, in person was the slow to return to in person, but... The so education didn't meet, stop. Yeah, uh, because the seminary is uh, in the same uh, office building where the church is. So okay, we use, uh, it's a multi-purpose facility. So uh, it was easier to uh, teach students uh, like in a worship hall uh, because it's big enough. You know, uh, they could be spread out. Sure. But it was it was actually nicer to be there in person. Yeah. <laughs> than, than teach online. Yeah, of course, of course we. Uh, there's a lot of different areas where we've done similar things. I, I, I've been involved with this class, the perspectives class, perspectives on the world Christian movement. And uh, of course, 
in the pandemic, it all just shut down. Everything went online. And, uh, and so then instead of having live instructors, they went to video base. So they were pre-recorded instructors and, and it just changes the whole dynamic of the class. Instead of talking to somebody and raising your hand and having a conversation, you're just listening for 40 minutes and then you go to session two and listen for 40 minutes. And, uh, and it's such a different, different thing. So yes, you can do it. But no, it's not as not as valuable. I don't I don't find the impact as being quite as good. So I'm so glad that that's been able to to get back um, to to normal for you as well. Um, so tell tell me about the Church of Moldova. Um, if if there was very little Christianity before the fall of the Soviet Union, 25 years later, you said many people were hearing the gospel, many people were coming to faith. Um, in other countries, similarly. Um, I find that there's a nationalism that that makes people somewhat resistant to the gospel, like uh, Republic of Georgia, for instance. The Orthodox Georgian Orthodox is so strong that to be Georgian is to be Orthodox, and when they even hear the gospel uh, from an evangelical perspective, the the, they they think that anyone who would convert from Georgian Orthodox would be almost becoming a traitor to their own country. So the faith is only a secondary piece. Um, but do you find that kind of thing, or are people more open to the gospel in Moldova? How, how do you see um, the state of the spiritual activity in Moldova? So um, I think after the fall of Soviet Union, again, there was a lot of, confusion so and the country was rebuilding so the government didn't pay much attention to us uh yet there was some opposition from the government and some opposition from the orthodox church um then the government changed our registration we used to be registered under a department of cults because any christian movement was considered a cult Mm. Uh, the orthodox church felt like they are superior because they were much longer uh, uh, in Moldova than we were. Uh, but then the government pretty much uh, uh, made us equal. They told the Orthodox and uh, Evangelicals that uh, we all are a cult. <laughs> okay, everybody. So everybody. Is. So And, of course, the church, uh, the Orthodox church didn't like that. But then we were... Um, uh, re-registered, so we're registered un- under the Ministry of Justice right, uh, right now. So uh, everyone is equal. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Any religious organization is equal. So there is not much uh, opposition. In fact, uh, the government actually, uh, today's government is more open to Christianity. Uh-huh. We don't hear much opposition from the Orthodox churches uh, anymore. Uh, maybe it's a local opposition in some mm-hmm. villages, you know, sure. some little towns. But uh, the government is... Uh, 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 is open to uh, Christians, uh, in fact, because we, uh, because of our work with the uh, refugees, Ukrainian refugees, um, many churches, including our church, uh, received a, a thank you letter from the president oh, awesome. uh, for the work we're doing. And that's great. That's great to hear. And it opens so, up uh, opens up doors. Um, uh, one of the questions that I wanted to answer is how. People are open to the gospel today. Um, it used to be that crowds would pray to receive Christ, but because uh, the doors were open not only for Christians to come in, but for, for various cults, people became very suspicious. Like we have a lot of Jehovah Witnesses and sure. Mormons. So it's more on a personal level now. Right. So you basically have to uh, uh, earn the trust of the person you're sharing Christ mm-hmm. with. Once you're in the trust, they w- would be uh, open to what you have to tell them. And I feel like that's, again, almost across the board nowadays. Like the the impact of mass media campaigns or the large-scale revivals has, has changed a lot, really, all around the world. Um, but there are places where, where there's opportunities like that. Um, but we find similar things here. People People don't care what you know until they know how much you care right and uh exactly. and so you have to you have to to care about them you can't just fake a relationship you have to have a relationship right you can't just act nice until you can share the gospel you actually have to be a friend and then through that friendship have a gospel conversation and you care throughout the entire thing there's all kinds of different tools and trainings that we do on trying to help people build gospel conversations and gospel type relationships to 
to help people encourage, help encourage them. It's, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing because that means it takes a lot of time. It's time intensive. You've got to, you've got to care. And, uh, that's not something you can do in a five minute conversation. So that's so true. Yeah. I love it. It really is. You have to empower the entire church to be gospel sharers so that you can have access to the entire community. And, uh, and many people in the church feel like that's just not their job. They're supposed to go and listen, but the pastors need to go and share. And you go, well, actually, we're all, we all have this task to go and make disciples. So I love that you brought that up, even the idea of church planting movements. Um, so let's, let's talk just a minute at the scope. Like uh, I, I had a couple of conversations with, with Eugene before, and um, one of the things he talked about was seminary students from different countries uh, coming to seminary in Moldova, and that God is using those those students to pastor and care for communities in different countries. Uh, do you have an idea of how many different countries are represented by the students there at the school? We, um, right now, I think we have a student from Russia. And uh, in the past, we had students from uh uh, Uzbekistan and, and uh, we had students from Kyrgyzstan uh, and we actually had a student from Nigeria who is a very well-known pastor uh, in uh, many states in Africa today. Wow, so. that's that's a, a broad scope. That's a lot of different 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 places and very different uh, ministry environments in each of those. Uh, well, that's exciting. I'm I'm really interested in learning more about that in the future, and so I, I'm looking forward to even when we're there in November visiting and seeing and and having some more of those questions. So we have a few minutes left. Um, as we finish, um, what are the things that that make you most excited about what God's doing today uh, in Moldova? I'm very excited about the new discipleship movement. Um, I think this is uh, what we're called for. Uh, uh, the uh, Great Commission, you know, so uh, uh, my desire, you know, is uh, to see uh, more people becoming disciples of Christ. I uh, personally started, uh, stopped praying for salvation. I started praying more for God to give us discipleship opportunities, uh, which includes salvation and the follow-up. Of course. You know, work with them. So, uh, and I've seen some results. Uh, my desire to see a big movement of uh, churches uh, planting other churches, um, which would uh, expand God kingdom, uh, God's kingdom in Moldova. So when when I uh, see opportunities like that, uh, uh, that gets me very excited. Yeah, of course, of course, I. I I can't wait to have longer conversations with you, Sergey, about that specific thing. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the things that makes my heart get so excited. Really, on a global scale, the the rise of, of the Great Commission in some ways. Like, for almost my whole life, when I go to church, I hear people talk about evangelize the lost, share your faith with the lost. Um, but when I look at the Great Commission, it doesn't talk about conversions. It doesn't talk about even even um, bold, bold proclamation of the gospel. It talks about disciple-making. And what does it mean? Of course, there has to be a proclamation of the gospel as a part of it. But if we think that our task is finished when our neighbor becomes a believer, it really is just the beginning of the task to help that person. For sure. The Great Commission says, like know and obey all that Jesus commanded, right? Teaching them to observe, to obey, and to 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 know his teachings. And it's, there's so many pieces to that. Like for one, I have to know his teachings and obey his teachings. And secondly, I need to train others how to do the same. And uh, and and many times, I think we assume that's what our churches are for. But more often than not, especially in America, people come to our church and they sit in a pew and they. They have a time of prayer, and it becomes almost like a, 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 a religious tradition. Like they go to the church to have a spiritual meal, and they eat, and they leave. And then they come back a week later to replenish their spiritual nourishment, right? It's, it's, it's almost like you go to the dinner at table at dinner, and you eat your meal, and, and that's what you do at night. That's what you do on Sunday morning as you go get your spiritual nourishment. And, and there's an element of that for sure. Uh, good, good community, part of the, part of the body, all the, the great things that happen. But are you obeying the commands of Jesus? Are we doing the things that he's told us to do? Do we even know what they are? It's another question. Yes, and and so <laughs> we, uh, we're working through how do we become more focused on 
training our members to become fully formed disciple makers, right? Not just people that know the Great Commission, but are practitioners of that Great Commission. Yep, exactly. And it's a different thing. It's a different thing. The church around the world is awakening to this, like, wow, we've got to figure out how to do this again. I think in the past, the church has had seasons where they did it really well. Obviously, Paul seemed to do it really well in the first century. There have been seasons in world history where the church has exploded and many churches have come out in a very short amount of time and and disciples are made. Um, One of those awakenings really came at the end of the 1980s, early 1990s, when communism kind of globally uh, fell apart and and there was opportunity in places that had been previously closed to the gospel, opportunity to share the gospel, and many thousands of people came to faith in a very short amount of time, and many churches were planted. Uh, but now it's a different season, and uh, and that season is is very much how do we take that new believing force, 20 to 30-year-old Christians who've been believers since the early 1990s, how do we help them take on the mission of God in their own hearts and lives? And so I can't wait to partner with the church in Moldova more on that. I can't wait to learn what God's doing through you. I can't wait to learn if there's ways that we can benefit from what you're learning or the things that you're learning that we need as well. I can't wait. The The church is, is more than ever. It's going to take the whole church to reach the whole world, right? Definitely. We definitely need the Moldovan church to be engaging the world. We need Sergey. we need Pastor Chad, we need all the people that call themselves Christians at First Baptist Church Bernie to take on the task of, of completing the Great Commission in our day. I'm excited about that. So, okay, I'll settle down just for a second. What are some ways that we can be praying for you? When, when, uh, when a First Baptist a member hears this podcast and they're thinking about Moldova, maybe for the first time, what do you want them to pray about and think about uh, when they think about your country and your church, your family? Well, uh, about the country and the people in the country, uh, 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 because we border Ukraine, uh, there's still, uh, sometimes we like feel there is uh, a danger, you know, of the war spilling on our uh, side, but we're uh, thankful for the clear sky, so uh, please continue praying for our safety, mm. uh, for uh, our uh, gospel ministry, you know, in uh, in the country. Uh, pray for more uh, disciples. Pray mm. for more uh, uh, discipleship opportunities for our church and the churches we partner with. Uh, pray for churches to continue uh, uh, practicing unity mm. uh, so that uh, we as one church could reach uh, uh, more disciples for Christ. Yeah, that's uh, great. So this these are probably the uh, the prayer request for for the churches uh, in Moldova. For our church specifically, um, please pray for uh, God to continue guiding us, leading us, uh, showing His vision, uh, what uh, He wants from our church uh, specifically. Uh, pray for uh, we've been praying for a long time for our own land for our for our own building so please join us in this prayer because mm. uh, uh the rent is uh, uh very expensive for us so uh, uh please keep us in prayer in this regard uh god has shown us his uh, faithfulness in the building where we are right now uh and we know you know uh, having our own multi-purpose building uh would even expand our ministries uh, in the city, in Moldova, and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the family, uh, usual u- usual uh, things, uh, pray for the safety of the family, pray for uh, God to give us stamina, uh, again, lead us, um, make us stronger in Him, you know, mm-hmm. because we depend on Him. And uh, for, uh, for my children to one day uh, be... Uh, di- uh, disciple, uh, disciples, makers, you know. Yeah, of course. Well, <laughs> in the same vein, pray that for my own family and for my own children. You know, I, how old are your kids? You told me already seven and 12. Seven and 12. Mine are 13 and 10, both my daughters. And, uh, <sighs> both of them have a faith in Christ. Both of them have been baptized. Both of them love the Lord. Um, but you, sh- you pray as a parent that one day, they will have a passion for making disciples as well. 
and uh, I'll do that. And that it's uh, not just not just an experience for them or a childhood thing that their parents is faith, but that's their own, right? So I'll pray for that for your Nikita and uh, Senia. and Senia. Uh, as well and uh so thank you for that um you know this whole podcast we call it the so that podcast and um it may not <clears throat> make sense but it's based out of these two words that come out of psalm 67 where, where god says paul david david writes may god be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us everyone knows those verses we read them all the time in our services but many people skip the next verse that says so that <laughs> why does God bless us and and grace? Why is He gracious? Why does He make us? It's so that His ways will be known on the earth and His salvation among all men. Right? the The idea is that God's blessing is always to be shared, always. Amen. And uh, and so if you're listening today and you hear us talking about Moldova and you're thinking you don't know a lot about Moldova, look it up, learn about it. It's a small country, uh, in. Uh, and it's it's got an incredible history, a history with Romania and all kinds of things. It's it's got a lot of uh, amazing history to it. Um, many Americans don't know much about Moldova, but learn about it. It's a it's an amazing thing that God is doing in that country, and uh, and so we're so thankful that FBC has an opportunity to partner. We've been partnering with Moldova, the KBC Church, and the seminary there for I think close to ten years, and uh, and so we take teams there every year. And why do we do that? It's so that we can be a blessing to them, and they can be a blessing to others. It's so that God's name, his salvation, will be made known among all the nations. Sergey, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, again, look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. And um, and for those of you who are listening, we hope that you've enjoyed the podcast. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to email us, reach out to us here at the church. Um, have a wonderful day, and God bless. We are so thankful that you joined our podcast today. We would love to hear any feedback you may have for us. Remember, Psalm 67 says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Don't forget why the Lord blesses us. It's so that we can be a blessing to those around us. Until next time, God bless.